Hey, what is up, everybody? I'm here to give you guys my review for WWE NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3. I know I'm a little late getting up this video, but I figured I'd do it now because I was, uh, I went, I ended up going to, uh, Top Rope, um, on that night, and then obviously I went to some, I, uh, ended up going to my friend's house to watch SummerSlam, as you guys saw the live reactions, which if you haven't checked that out, check out the live reactions, uh, down in the description box below. And, yeah, so I'm here to give you guys the review now. I watched the entire show, um, and I'm going to be giving you guys my review of uh, WWE NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. So we had the pre-show. We had uh, Charlie Caruso, uh, Sam Roberts, Corey Graves, and Lito on the uh, panel. Um, I thought they did a pretty decent job on the panel. And uh, the first thing, they pretty much, you know, do what they panel normally does, break down uh, the matches that are going to be taking place on the show, uh, but we had some cool stuff on the pre-show, I thought. We had uh, Renee Young first uh, interviews uh, Kurt Angle, and I guess this was Kurt Angle's first time that he had been down in NXT, even though I thought he was there when um, he came back earlier this year and NXT take over Orlando, um, and he talks about how it's... Uh, you know, uh, really cool, and he talks about how he's looking forward to seeing the NXT Championship match and the NXT Women's Championship match, and um, then she, um, Renee Young, which, by the way, it was cool to see Renee Young back in NXT. They even do, like, a, f a little photo op where they showed uh, Renee Young, uh, Corey Graves, Lita, and Byron Saxon on the panel from two years ago, and they talk about how it's their anniversary, and they make a joke how Byron Saxon wasn't there. I thought that was funny. But then she asked uh, Kurt Angle if he's doing any scouting um, for any possible superstars uh, that he uh, could be signing in Monday Night Raw. And uh, he says, I'm not exactly sure yet, but he makes it sound like uh, that he actually will be signing um, superstars. But I have a feeling nothing will come of it. Um, it would be qu kind of cool if they did it, but I don't think they would. Then next, uh, Big E gets interviewed. Um, he ends up taking a leader spot um, from the pre-show. And... Um, yeah, he did a really good job. Um, he was just acting like himself. He talks about the uh, NXT Tag Team Championship match. He talks about... Um, he put, he builds up the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championship match coming up tomorrow night. He talks about his run in NXT. You know, talks about how he was, um, you know, NXT champion. He talks about the five-count gimmick and the opportunities that NXT has have given him. I thought that was really well done. He was being funny. Um, and, it, yeah, he pretty much was just acting like the Big E you see in the New Day, which kind of shows that Big E is an interesting character. So I thought that was funny. And then uh, Shinsuke Nakamura gets interviewed, and he talks about how it feels good to be back in NXT, how he's going to take the WWE Championship at SummerSlam, and that was about it. Really worse, they didn't have him talk, just because of the fact that, um, you know, um, the reason why I wish he didn't talk is because obviously he's not the best on uh, speaking because he doesn't speak very fluid English. I wish they would have just had him come out and make his entrance and that would have popped the crowd easier. But what do you, what can you do? And then uh, Neville gets interviewed and he pretty much breaks down the match going down between um, Alistair Black and Hideo Itami. You know, he talks about how he beat Alistair Black back at the uh, United Kingdom Championship uh, Tournament. And... Um, he talks about his history with the day with Tommy. He talks about his uh, match coming up uh, at SummerSlam where he's going to regain the uh, Cruiserweight Championship. And I like that he stayed in kayfabe. The only thing I didn't like about this was that every uh, Neville's mic really wasn't working, so they had to give him a new one, and then that mic didn't work, so you couldn't really hear Neville. But um, then he talks about then he breaks down the uh, he talks about his history at NXT, and he talks about you know how he's gone from a little boy to now the man that you see on 205 Live every week. He talks about how NXT was supposed to provide him these opportunities, but he never received any of them, which I thought was actually kind of funny. Um, and then uh, Corey Graves asks uh, Neville to give his thoughts on the match between uh, Johnny Gargano and Andrade Cien Almas. And, um, you know, because since they're having a match, how Johnny Gargano can bounce back from the betrayal from Tommaso Ciampa and uh, DIY. And Neville uh, pretty much pokes fun at him as well. I think you know uh, that I bounced back pretty well when you stabbed me in the back. And Corey Graves just gets really awkward. And I thought Neville did a great job on the panel. He was awesome. Um, and then uh, Carmella and uh, Sasha Banks get interviewed. They pretty much take uh, 
Sam Wabitz and Corey Graves were on the panel. They made it seem like a big deal that it was a women's panel. They pretty much talk about the uh, NXT Women's Championship match. They talk about um, what their roles could be at SummerSlam. You know, Sasha Banks' Wild Women's Championship match and Carmella's um, possibly cashing in the Money in the Bank contract. And uh, they also talk about the Mayon Classics, and that was about it. Uh, but in this panel, you could totally see what that inner bitchiness um, of Sasha Banks is. Because she was trying not to be a bitch, but she kind of was being a bitch. She was trying to stay in kayfabe. And then um, Baron Corby gets interviewed, um, and he talks about failing his Money in the Bank cash-in. He talks about the uh, NXT Championship match and who he wants to win. And then he talks about his match coming up against John Cena, and that was about it. And then next, we had a video package for uh, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3. I thought it looked really good, good, uh, really good building up the angle, so I, I liked that. Then we, um, So overall, the pre-show I thought was pretty good. They had everybody there. They had all the past um, NXT stars there. Um, other NXT stars that were there that I just want to mention before I forget is uh, you saw um, Kalisto. Uh, he was there. He was in the crowd. Uh, you saw um, Samoa Joe and... Um, Kevin Owens, you know, Samoa Joe, first ever two-time NXT champion, and Kevin Owens uh, pretty much helped in 2015 bring up NXT. Um, and who else was in the crowd that I forget in? Oh, and I forgot, uh, Becky Lynch and uh, Bailey were there. They even got interviewed backstage, if they just forgot to write that down, and they gave their thoughts on the NXT Women's Championship match, and Bailey gave an update, um, an update about uh, her injury. It was really kind of weird that they flew out Becky Lynch but didn't have a wrestle a match at SummerSlam or anything. Now that I think about it, it was really kind of stupid. Um, and they, well, I, I'll talk about Carmella later. Um, and then um, that was about it. Um, so overall, like the pre I thought uh, they really pulled out all the stops and got all the pastos. The only pet stall that wasn't there that I wish was there was obviously Finn Balor. You know, he was the longest reigning NXT champion in history, and he wasn't there. I thought that was kind of stupid. He's probably been, like, the best superstar you could ever have at NXT with the stuff he's done in NXT, so I don't know why he wasn't there. Um, so, overall, well, I thought the pre-show was really well done. This would have meant more, though, if they weren't going to have uh, SummerSlam and NXT TakeOver in Brooklyn next year, but whatever. Then we had the actual show itself. We had the commentary team of uh, Percy Watson, Moore Winilo, and um, Nigel McGuinness. I thought they all did pretty well on commentary. I feel bad for Percy Watson, man, because he didn't really get to say much on this show. And, you know, him and Molo, Molo and Nigel, I think, just have such good chemistry together. He's just kind of like the third wheel, so I do feel bad for him. I mean, he does, I mean, he got to speak more on this show, but those matches where he doesn't say anything at all. Um, and it's not, that, and I don't think it's necessary because of Molo and Nigel, but I'll, talk, I'll get to that in a second. And uh, we had the first match. Well, first, actually, the, the, the band um, Red Orange, I believe it's called. Um, yeah, red on. I think it's red orange. Um, I have it in my notes. I don't know why. No, cold, cold orange. There you go. Uh, they performed their song, uh, Bleeding. I, I have the name here, the sorry. Uh, Bleeding it, um, in the blue. They just performed that, like, performed that right in the opening of the show. This was the first time that NXT had, like, a live band play for the specials. And, um, then, um, yeah, and they showed, like, the video package of, like, all those superstars that are going to be on it and stuff. And, um, it was really cringeworthy because the band really wasn't all that good. And I'm not really going to fault NXT for it because, uh, they tried to make this feel special. And the video package did look really cool. But it, it, this band was just really cringeworthy the way they played. And, uh, it was, I just felt bad because NXT tried to make this, like, a big deal. And it was supposed to be something good. And the band just kind of sucks. So, I feel bad for them. Um, and, um, we had the, but then we had the first match on the show. It was, uh, Johnny Gargano versus Andrade Cien Omas with, uh, Selena Vega inside. I thought this was a, uh, really good, um, opening match up here. Um, Johnny Gargano, uh, you know, dominates the first half of it. He hits a drop kick. Onto uh, almost um, almost starts to take control. He uh, hits a head scissors and he kind of starts to show off a little bit. And then um, almost um, Gargano goes to show that almost like you know um, uh, just stands there on the ropes and does his taunt. And he goes um, Gargano goes to show that him almost moves out of the way and almost starts to work over the injured shoulder of uh, Gargano. 
he uh, hits a tri um a uh, um a triangle choke uh, holding his shoulder. He uh, just really works over the shoulder of Andrade and almost Johnny Gargano starts to make his uh, comeback. He had a lot of really good comeback moves. He had, uh, you know, um, a, a flying clothesline, the uh, slingshot spear through the wall, the rolling kick, and um, then uh, Johnny Gargano hits the slingshot DDT, a 12-pace suicidal on the outside, and um, then um, on what else? Um, almost tries to do his taunt again, and Gargano hits the kick, and then the su suicide dive and stuff happens afterwards, and uh, Andrade and almost. Hits a uh, um, a backbreaker into a elbow drop while Gargano is trapped in the ropes, and then eventually he's able to um, when Gargano is going for the slingshot spear a second time, um, almost catches him like he's going to do a draping DDT, but instead he turns it into an inverted reverse DDT, and he covers him. Gargano kicks out, and um, then he. Uh, um, Tommaso Ciampa tries to hit a sunset flip, but, um, not Tommaso Ciampa, sorry, Johnny Gargano goes for a sunset flip, um, almost it lands on his feet, and, uh, hits a, uh, arm drag into the corner, he goes for the double knee, he goes for the, uh, almost, um, ambition, I, th I believe it's what it's called, um, but, uh, Gargano moves out of the way, and Gargano hits a, uh, gets him into the submission, the, uh, Gargano lock, I believe it's called, but almost reverses it, hits a buckle bomb, and then he hits the Amos um, amplification, and he covers him. Um, Gargano kicks out, and then um, Gargano hits like a bunch of like three super kicks in a row, and he goes for the his fi his finish. Selena Vega though throws in a DIY T-shirt, and Johnny Gargano looks at it in disbelief, and uh, almost hits the drop kick into the corner, and then a hammerlock DDT for the win. And Andrade Cien almost goes over. Um, obviously, I didn't pick him to win. I think I only got one match right, actually, for my predictions on this show. Um, and, uh, yeah, Andrade Cien almost... I th I'm fine with the winning just because the way they did it, you know, they still had Johnny Gargano act like he was upset about the breakup by having the DIY t-shirt. You started to kind of slowly tease to the Johnny gargano Tommaso Ciampa match. And, yeah... Um, I think, obviously, uh, the match I still thought was really good. Almas and Gargano, I thought, worked a really good match. Um, and, uh, I think it makes sense, kind of, to put on Ronnie Sand almost over. I just didn't think he was going to win, because normally they throw him out there to lose on takeovers. But he just has this new gimmick, where he's with Selena Vega now. It really would make sense for him to win. And, uh, you can really tell a story with Johnny Gargano, where he keeps losing. Um, because it doesn't make sense for him that all of a sudden he's just a singles wrestler now, and... You know, obviously, I know he's been a singles wrestler before, but you get what I'm saying. So I think I'm I'm fine with the booking decision of Gargano going um, of Gargano losing and almost winning. Um, I expect this few, I expect this to them to have another match where it actually becomes a few, but we'll have to wait and see. And then Kurt Angle and uh, Daniel Bryan are in the crowd. They're just watching the show, and NXT superstars um, are back there, like wanting to get signed. You had Roderick Strong, No Way Jose, and uh, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce, and then. Uh, we had the next match. It was an NXT Tag Team Championship match. NXT Tag Team Champions, the Altars of Pain with Paul Ellering Winside versus uh, Killian Dane and Alexander Wolfe with Nikki Cross and Eric Young Winside. And we had Corey Graves come out and do commentary for this match, which I thought was awesome. I mean, it makes sense for him to commentate this match since he's a former NXT Tag Team Champion. And I like that they had him out there. It was kind of nice to hear him on commentary in NXT again. And um, really, the match is just really dark. Um, called by Mo and uh, Corey Graves. Percy Watson and Nigel McGuinness speak at points, uh, but not as much. I think they didn't really want to have Nigel say anything because Corey Graves was, I guess, supposed to be the heel commentator, so it is what it is. Uh, but the match starts. Um, Alters of Pain came out with uh, dressed as Ninja Turtles, which I thought was kind of cool. And Alters of Pain attack um, Wolf and uh, Dane. And, uh, you know, the, uh, all the teams stop walling with each other. Um, Eric Young, as the Brawlin pulls out a table, he sets it up, uh, he just leans it against the barricade, and, um, Alexander Wolf, uh, they continue, um, they continue to brawl, one of the authors of pain slams, um, Alexander Wolf head first on the apron, and he hits a clothesline on Alexander Wolf on the outside, then the authors of pain dominate, um, Alexander Wolf for a while, and, uh, Wazo goes for, um, to hit a corner splash on him, 
But um, Alexander Wolf moves out of the way, and uh, he ends up going shoulder first. And he acts like he's going to tag Dill Killian Dane. But Eric Young gets up on the apron instead. And he has a Killian Dane get off the apron. And Killian Dane does. And he tags in Eric Young. Because technically, since Killian Dane never got tagged in the match, um, he, he never was legal in the match. And Eric, um, so it ended up working. It was a way that Sanity uh, was going to outsmart Arthur Zapan. I thought that worked really well. And then um, Eric Young um, goes after uh, Wazo. He attacks him on the outside. He throws him shoulder first into the steps. But uh, um, Razor starts to fight back. He, clo he th close lines him over the um, barricade. And uh, um, Akum and um, Alexander Wolf stop brawling. Uh, and uh, Eric Young comes up out, out of the barricade. He pulls Razor over the barricade. And um, they fight in the crowd. Um, Eric Young um, gets Irish ripped into like the guardrail in the crowd. And uh, he goes to, um, Razor goes to splash him, but Eric Young moves out of the way. And um, they both fight to the win. The Authors of Pain pretty much dominate um, um, Eric Young for a while. Uh, they hit a, uh, like a double team where uh, one of the Authors of Pain hit like a back suplex, um, a back body drop, and then the other one caught him, hit like a Canadian backbreaker into an X Factor, which I thought looked really cool. And the Authors of Pain just really dominate Eric Young. Um, Eric Young tries to make um, a comeback. And he's able to get the hot tag on Alexander Wolf. And Alexander Wolf immediately takes out one of the Authors of Pain members with a pump kick. And he starts hitting German suplexes and pump kicks on the other one. And I thought that looked really cool. And uh, then eventually um, the Authors of Pain are able to get the upper hand. They hit the uh, powerbomb neckbreaker combo. Onto uh, Alexander Wolf, he kicks out. Then they go to hit it off the uh, turnbuckle, but Alexander Wolf um, counters into a Hurricane and he tags in Eric Young. Eric Young starts going off. He goes for the uh, elbow drop off the uh, top turnbuckle, but um, um, if he gets stopped, and the Authors of Pain are going to hit a double superplex off uh, onto uh, Eric Young, but um, Nikki Cross holds Eric Young's legs. Um, and he accidentally, and, uh, actually it was supposed to be a, um, and, uh, one of the authors of pain accidentally powerbombed his brother, well, his partner, which looked really cool, and Eric Young hits the elbow drop, tries to make the pin, but the author, authors of pain member breaks it up, and then, uh, Eric Young hits a torpe suicida on the outside, and Wolf hits, like, a flip corkscrew onto the other one on the outside, and Nikki Cross is gonna hit a dive, but, uh, Paul Ellerin wants to stop her, but the referee is dealing with Paul Ellerin, and Nikki Cross goes to hit the dive. One of the Authors of Pain members catches her, and, uh, Killian Dane puts him through the table, and Killian, um, Nikki Cross takes a big bump. And then, uh, Eric Young and Alexander Wolf hit a, uh, sidewalk slam neckbreaker combo on the other member of the Authors of Pain, and they actually win the NXT Tag Team Championship. Sanity are now the NXT Tag Team Champions. I did not see that coming at all. I didn't think Sanity was going to win, but they did. And I actually popped boy because I actually was enjoying this match uh, quite a bit. I thought this match was uh, nice, crazy, and chaotic. And um, it's really cool that Eric Young now is uh, someone that was kind of utilized very badly in TNA. And when he would, when he was in TNA, you know, was he, he, all the bad stuff he was given, he made the most out of it. It's finally like a champion in WWE. Uh, that's awesome. And, obviously, I think Sanity has face. They wrestle clearly like the faces in this match. And Alexander Wolf can actually wrestle. Um, I Obviously, you've been watching my past few NXT videos. And I'm, I've been talking about how Alexander Wolf just does, um, is just bad. But, obviously, here, he was really good. Um, I was surprised. He actually had some good wrestling ability, so I was surprised. But then the next thing that happens is... Um, but, uh, Bobby Fish and um, Kyle O'Reilly come out, and they attack pretty much everybody. And they lay out Altars of Pain, and they lay out Sanity. Um, I thought that looked really cool. They hit like a uh, run in, like a run and kick combo onto uh, Eric Young, and they just destroy Sanity. I thought that was awesome, and uh, it really worked. Um, I thought it really worked. It really um, strikes. 
a, um, a lightning bolt right into the NXT Tag Title Division because the NXT Tag Title Division really wasn't anything special. And now you have um, three teams. You have Bobby Fish and um, Kyle O'Reilly. You have the Altars of Pain and you have Sanity. And I think this uh, match set up um, a lot of tag matches you can do in the future. Obviously, they're going to probably want to do the rematch between the Altars of Pain and um, Sanity, whatever two members it is. And then maybe you could do a one-on-one -on -one with Sanity and Kyle O'Reilly and uh, Bobby Fish. And then obviously, you could probably at some point do a triple threat. I do expect um, a series of tag matches to come out of this, and I think it's awesome. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to see what they do with this. Um, but there's more, there's, there's more that happens with it, though, actually. So then next we had uh, Hideo Itami versus Alistair Black, and Jim Ross was on commentary for this match. I thought this was the perfect match for Jim Ross to commentate. And uh, I felt bad for Percy Watson, though, because he didn't really get to say anything because... Nigel, Molo, and Jim Ross kind of called the whole match. Like I said, this is why I feel bad for Percy somewhat. And um, Alexander Black um, has um, Red Owens perform his, uh, his theme song, which I thought was kind of cool. And um, they actually did a lot, really good job with that, at least. And um, this match was really stiff. I thought this was a good match here. Um, they both hit just kicks. Uh, together on each other, and they both keep trying to kick each other's heads off. Uh, Tommy gets the upper hand. At, well, Alistair Black hits a kick right to the chest, and then Tommy gets the upper hand. He uh, hits a suplex um, and hit, hits some ribs first right into the ropes. He hits a guillotine knee drop, and hit pretty much, and I think this busted um, Black's nose open, which uh, when that happened, which was uh, you know um, kind of cool. And then today, when Tommy starts to dominate the matchup. Um, he just hits uh, simple chin blocks and stuff, hits knee drops on uh, Al Alistair Black. Alistair Black makes his comeback. He uh, hits a uh, torpe cut heel on the outside. He uh, hits a wicked kick kick to the chest. He uh, hits a uh, cl flying clothesline off the top turnbuckle. Atami makes his, uh, um, and the match pretty much just goes back and forth. Atami hits a falcon arrow, Michinuku driver off the turnbuckle. I don't exactly know what what exactly it was because it looked like it was both. It looked like it was like a Falcon arrow into a Michinuku driver, uh, but a Black kicks out. Black hits a high knee into a Falcon arrow, and uh, Hatami kicks out. Um, Hatami gets him into like a um, a cross face, and eventually the finish comes when Alistair Black hits a Black Mass for the win. And obviously it made sense to have Alistair Black go over since they uh, seem to be really pushing him behind him, and obviously he's got that undefeated streak going on, so I think it made sense. And uh, yeah, I'm glad they, um, I thought they worked a good match here, and I thought this match was really stiff. And then we had the next match, it was an NXT, um, Women's Championship match, NXT Women's Champion Asuka versus Ember Moon, and this match was really good. This match, um, had everything, storytelling, and it was a really good match. Ember Moon immediately hits a dropkick right onto Asuka, she hits a drop toe hold and dominates Asuka throughout the beginning portions of this matchup. Um, she hits a... Um, cannonball from the uh, top turnbuckle to the outside, and then eventually um, Asuka is just trying to escape from her. Asuka throws her shoulder first into the steps, and she starts to target the injured shoulder of Ember Moon. She hits a uh, Northern Lights um, suplex on the outside, like onto the steel that they have um, set up on the ramp, and uh, um, she had um, Ember Moon's shoulder like right behind her back, so that really affected the shoulder. And Asuka goes right after the shoulder of Ember Moon. Ember Moon keeps trying to fight back again, again, and again. But um, Asuka's just not having it. Um, Ember Moon tries to go for a hip toss. Asuka re re goes to reverse it into the Asuka lock. But Ember Moon goes for one for of her own. Asuka tries to get an Asuka lock in, but Ember Moon reverses it into a roll-up. And then Ember Moon starts to make her comeback. She hits a uh, cr crossbody. Um, Ember Moon, Asuka kicks out. She hits a... Um, Face first, uh, face buster, um, Asuka kicks out, um, Asuka hit a kick right to the head of Ember Moon, Ember Moon kicked out, and they both start just laying, uh, fists on each other, Asuka hits a German suplex, um, and sends Ember Moon spat, um, into the, uh, turnbuckle, um, back of the head, um, that was weird to say, but whatever, and they both start brawling with each other, Ember Moon then hits the, uh, Eclipse, no, actually, no, she, first she hits the uh, Tornado Suplex out of the corner, 
Asuka kicks out. Then she hits the Eclipse. So this is the move that uh, Asuka tried to avoid before. Before And she covers Asuka. Asuka kicks out. And I popped when she kicked out because no one's ever kicked out of the Eclipse. See, when you protect finishers, when, and then when people kick out of them, it's actually a huge deal. And then she tries to go for it again. And they try to do the spot they get at NXT TakeOver Orlando where Asuka pulls the referee in front of her. But Ember Moon doesn't buy it this time. And she hits a cross body. Um, and um, Asuka reverses it. Um, rolls her up. Holds the tights. But the referee catches her. And then um, um, Ember Moon... So the referee calls off, calls off the um, cover. And uh, Ember Moon then hits a super kick on Asuka. Covers her. Um, Asuka, Asuka kicks out, and then Asuka starts to play possum, she acts like she's dead, Ember Moon goes to pick her up, Asuka get, goes to put her into the, uh, cross arm breaker, Ember Moon holds her, um, hands together, and then, um, afterwards she turns it into the Asuka lock, Ember Moon tries to win with the roll up, but, uh, Asuka's just strapped in the Asuka lock, and, um, Ember Moon's in this move for a while, but, and she has no choice but to tap out, and Asuka wins and retains the title, she walks off, Ember Moon afterwards um, is upset that she lost and she gets a stand and ovation afterwards. And um, yeah, um, I thought this match was really good. Um, you know, I thought this was really good back and forth action. And I was really surprised about the finish that Asuka retained. I expected Ember Moon, because of the story that they were telling, to retain, well, to win, win and finally conquer Asuka's undefeated streak. Um, and. Um, yeah, no, but I guess that didn't happen, though. And uh, I like the way, too, they sold the reactions every time they kicked out, especially Ember Moon's reaction when Asuka kicked out of her finish. And she ended up, like, queuing up a little. I thought that was awesome. Um, and overall, I thought this was a really awesome match. It, was, um, this, it, it really stole the show. Now, I want to talk about this because I did just see this uh, right after um, I, um, you know, um, I just see this right after this was over. Um, it's called, um, and I was gonna, I'm not, I don't want to make it a separate video cause if I'm doing this video now. It's called NXT Women's Champion Asuka Suffers Injury at NXT at TakeOver Brooklyn 3. It says NXT Women's Champion Asuka broke her right collarbone during her successful title defense against Ember Moon Saturday at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3. WWE has learned uh, due to the injury, the Empress of Tomorrow is not medically cleared to compete. And no official timetable has been given for her return. The typical recovery time for a broken collarbone is six to eight weeks, according to ringside physician Dr. Jeffrey Westerfield, who tended to ask her in Brooklyn. Um, during the match, she landed awkwardly from a throw from Ember Moon and was able to complete the match, but had not stable pain. Um, and discomfort, Mr. Westerfield said, we've performed an initial ultrasound backstage that was highly suspicious of a break that was later confirmed by an x-ray. News of the injury as Asuka approaches the 507 day mark of her historic NXT Women's title reign. She has yet to be defeated in NXT since debuting in October 2015. Stay with WWE.com as details on Asuka's condition become available. Now, I'm assuming this is legit thin. Um, I'm not sure if um, this is uh, legit or not. So I'm going to guess what I think they should do is they should uh, have her vacate the title because of the injury. Um, because I think that would make sense. And um, I think that would make sense. Um, and then you, um, when Asuka does return... Instead of putting her right back on NXT, because really there's no one le left for her to face in NXT. Uh, the only people that can she, she can really face is the people in the Mae Young Classics. Um, but uh, we don't really know how they're going to perform. Um, the only person I can see really beating Asuka was that chick, Khan San. That's the only person I can see beating Asuka uh, that's in that tournament, because she just looks like that she could. Um... But I would actually not have that happen. Either what I would have happen is I would have Asuka have to vacate the title. And she then she gets called right up to the main roster right afterwards. Because um, there's really nothing left for Asuka to do in NXT. You could say, well, she could go back for the, the belt, a title that she never lost. But, that really, but, then, but then 
They really wouldn't do much. This is a chance that they can take the title off Asuka without having to lose it. And you have to go up to the main loss to undefeat it. I think that would be awesome. And you have to wrestle. Because it's... um. Because really, she doesn't have anyone to wrestle. Emma Moon's really the only person that you could say is just on Asuka's level. But I don't even know if Emma Moon really is. Because Emma Moon, I would say, brought the best out of Asuka. No one knows. Like, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce are fine wrestlers, but they're nowhere near close to Asuka's level. Nikki Cross, not at all. Um, I think Asuka, it's time for her to go, go up to the main roster. You know, you sh um, as for where she should go, I'm not really sure. She could go on Raw. And wrestle someone like a Sasha Banks, um, Bailey. Um, we've seen the Bailey match, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, you could, she can go on uh, SmackDown. She can wrestle Becky Lynch. That would be really good. Uh, Charlotte um, and uh, well, Natalia. Um, she can have some great matches. As for where she should go, I'm not really sure because the problem is, is um, that she should go on the show that's going to get watched more. And the problem is, is if she goes on SmackDown because of the way. Uh, uh, because of the way that SmackDown's been lately, it's been off. Um, I would say maybe go to Raw. So, we'll have to wait and see on that. Because look what happened to Shinsuke Nakamura. I'm just saying. Um, we're going to have to wait and see on that. And if you want to have an high who should be the new NXT Women's Champion, you can either have uh, Ember Moon. I want to say have a tournament, but you're kind of doing a women's tournament. Uh, what I would do is I would have whoever the finalists of the Mayon Classic are going to be. You have them fight it out and wrestle uh, for the vacated NXT Women's title um, and you have them win the title because that's because that's the only thing that could happen. Um, and, and if you're all going to keep Asuka in NXT, then whoever wins that Mae Young Classic should face Asuka and beat her for the title. Um, because uh, um, I have said that the NXT, whoever wins that should get a prize. What bigger prize is there and, you know, you can go for the Raw, you can go for the SmackDown Women's title. That's great. But there's only one person that's going to go down in history as defeated Asuka. And whoever wins the Mae Young Classic should want to go out and defeat Asuka. So we're gonna, um, that's what I think should happen. Uh, but we're going to have to wait and see on that. Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts on Asuka's injury. Now let me get back to reviewing NXT, which is what I was kind of doing. This kind of had to do with that. Then we had the main event. It was an NXT Championship match. NXT champion Bobby Roode versus Drew McIntyre. Um, I love the entrances in this match. You had Drew McIntyre come out with uh, like a band, pretty much a Scotland band. They had band pipes, bass drums, uh, playing his theme song. What kind of sucked about it is you couldn't really hear him because because his theme song was actually playing. And yet Bobby Roode, he was coming out with the same way he did at NXT Takeover Chicago, where he come out with the electric piano playing, and you had um, him come out like he was. Coming out from coming like coming from heaven because uh, the way it looked, I thought that looked awesome. And this match, I thought was um, a uh, really good main event. Um, I'm not sure what match is better, if it's this match or if it's uh, the NXT Women's Championship match. Um, and uh, you know the match starts off. Bobby Roode at first is trying to run away from Drew McIntyre, being the heel. Um, he hits chops on him. Eventually, McIntyre is able to catch him. Um, he starts uh, beating the crap out of him. He hits a wicked clothesline on him. He um, manhandles Drew McIntyre. He hits a um, a float over suplex. He clotheslines him out of the ring, and, uh, and then he hits a uh, tilt to will power slam onto the uh, win apron. And I thought that looked really awesome, actually. And uh, he covers Wood in the ring. Uh, McIntyre kicks out. No, Wood kicks out. Sorry, and um, then eventually Bobby Roode gets the upper hand. I'm trying to remember exactly how he got the upper hand. Um, I'm trying to remember how he got the upper hand. I'm trying to remember how he got the upper hand. Um, so I remember um, he got the upper hand somehow. Um, wow, I'm drawing a blank on that. So I remember they like fought. Um, how did he get the upper hand? Fuck, I, I just watched this match, too, and I'm trying to remember how he got the upper hand. Um, well, I remember Wu dominates the matchup for a while, but I'm trying to remember how he get, um, like, I don't remember how he gets the upper hand, but I feel bad about that. Um, so Wu dominates the matchup for a while, and, um, eventually Drew McIntyre starts to make his comeback. He hits a, uh, 
flying clothesline off the top turnbuckle, and uh, he uh, hits a uh, you know um, yeah the flying he uh, goes for the future shock DDT. McIntyre um, Rude reverses it. Um, he throws Rude, he, he throws McIntyre into the steel post. He um, hits a uh, power bomb off the turnbuckle. McIntyre kicks out. Um, Rude hits a uh, goes for the glorious TDT a ton of times. McIntyre uh, continues to click out. McIntyre hits the like a version of the Claymore kick. Um, Rude kicks out. McIntyre hits a boot. Rude kicks out, and um, McIntyre hits a uh, uh, throws Rude off the uh, turnbuckle as uh, while he's in the tree of roll position, and um, then um, McIntyre hits the um, hits the future shock DDT. Um, he covers Rude. Rude uh, gets um, his foot on the ropes. No, he kicks out, and then he hits the Claymore kick. Rude gets to the, his foot on the ropes, and uh, then McIntyre hits a dive on the outside. Um, throws him in the ring, goes for the Claymore kick. Um, Rude hits, uh, counters into a spine buster, um, covers him. McIntyre kicks out. Rude goes for the uh, glorious DDT. McIntyre counters it, and uh, he goes for another future shock DDT. Um, and then um, Rude turns it into a tilt to will glorious DDT, um, covers him, McIntyre kicks out, and then he hits another glorious DDT, and he goes to hit it another one like he did to a day with Tommy in NXT TakeOver um, Chicago, but McIntyre counters it, and he hits the Claymore kick for the win, and he wins the NXT Championship, and obviously this was, a, I thought was awesome, this was vindication for Drew McIntyre for all, his first one when he was uh, tweeted like crap, so I thought that was awesome. And then um, afterwards, you think the show's going to go off the air. The logo comes up, the WWE, you know, sports entertainment logo, the show on every show. But then uh, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish are on the apron, and McIntyre um, goes over to him, and he gets attacked from behind by Adam Cole. Now, they just leaked out that Adam Cole had signed with uh, NXT um, a few days before that, so I thought that was awesome. And he attacks. McIntyre, um, you know, Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly beat, beat, beat the crap out of him, and they hold up, up to McIntyre so that way uh, um, Adam Cole can hit a super kick on him, and Adam Cole stands over him holding uh, the NXT uh, championship. And afterwards, um, this was on the, the WWE.com exclusive, they walk off, and then you see him just walking backstage. And obviously this is now going to be a faction in NXT, this was pretty much, these were pretty much guys that have been huge in uh, Win of Honor and uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. I believe Adam Cole was in the Boulder Club. Um, and I don't, and obviously I heard that like, Kyle Valley and Bobby Fish were a tag team all over the world. So I'm actually pretty excited about this. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really cool. So I expect that at some point we're going to get McIntyre versus Adam Cole. He's probably at the next takeover. What they're going to probably do with Bobby Roode is they showed up a, a WWE.com exclusive for him where he was pissed off that he lost and then Roderick Strong came up blowing a kiss. Uh, they're going to probably set up a match between them. I think it makes sense to take the title off Roode. Obviously, McIntyre should have won the title regardless. But obviously, I think it's um, you've done enough uh, with Bobby Roode and Roderick Strong where you don't, need to leave, you, where you don't really need to have them be fighting over for a championship, I think they can just have a grudge match, and you have um, probably Roderick Strong win that match, since I expect Bobby Roode to be called up to the main roster after uh, um, probably earlier next year, so I think that's going to be his last match is against Roderick Strong at whatever the NXT TakeOver is going to be uh, before NXT before Survivor Series later on this year, and then you have McIntyre versus Adam Cole. You probably have Adam Cole win the uh, NXT title, and you have... Uh, Strong, you have Fish and Kyle O'Reilly win the NXT tag titles, and you have like a faction with that has all the titles, which I think would look pretty cool. You really haven't had a faction that's really taken over NXT. You sort of had, you sort of had Sanity, but they didn't really like feud with anybody. What they didn't really feud with like Shinsuke Nakamura when he was champion. They really feuded with uh, like mid card guys who had. Um, so I think uh, having um, Adam Cole and uh, Kyle O'Reilly and, uh, you know, um, Bobby Fish being a faction is going to be awesome. I think maybe, too, we can make NXT, like, back to being 
talked about again because it's still really good, but I don't think people no one it's not as big as it was a couple of years ago, maybe even say a little over a year ago. Um, so I think maybe having this faction come in, people will start watching NXT and really start talking about it again. So I think that's awesome. And I can't wait to see what happens with this. Um, I, ex I don't expect them to do anything with it this week since they're going to show stuff from earlier um, in, this, in this show that they taped for this week's episode. But I can't wait to see what they do with this within a couple of weeks. I expect McIntyre and Rude, though, to have a rematch. And I can't wait to see that rematch. And then, obviously, I expect Strong to probably cost Rude. Um, I, I, I expected Strong to cost Rude here, but I guess they didn't really want to have... Um, I, um, McIntyre win the title. They probably wanted to have him win it clean, which I thought was awesome. Um, so what's probably going to happen is Rude's going to get out of this, is going to go um, and get back to his feud with uh, Roderick Strawn. And it, um, obviously now that he doesn't have the belt, um, it's easier for him to go in that feud. But yeah, and then we're going to get the ROH invasion. But overall, I thought this was a uh, I thought this was actually a uh, really good takeover. I don't think this is the, my, the best takeover. I definitely th uh, thought before, uh, up until we got to the main event um, that this show was just kind of like good. But I think the main event and uh, the NXT Women's Title match really made this show. Um, and if I had to give this show like an actual rating, I'm going to give it a uh, 8.5 out of 10. I really thought the matches delivered. Um, I thought they did a good job setting up a big angle coming out of the show. And, um, yeah, they just um, had a, a lot of really good matches. Not a bad takeover yet with NXT. I don't think there's been a bad one yet. Um, I mean, there's been ones I haven't, like, 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 like that, there's, like, ones that are better than others. But I don't think there's, like, been, been a takeover where I've come on here and say, oh, this was shit. So I'm impressed. But now let me get to my star rating. So for the... Um, Andrade Cien Omas, um, Johnny Gargano match. I'll probably give that match. Um, I'll probably give that match a uh, three and a half stars. I thought that was a uh, really good match. The white person I thought went over. And then for the NXT Tag Team Championship match, um, I'm probably gonna give that match a uh, three and a quarter. I thought that was a really. Um, I thought that was a really good match. I think the reason why I'm not waiting it higher is because I think we got spoiled with the NXT Tag Title matches with the Revival and uh, Hashtag DIY because those matches were so good that any that no other NXT Tag Title match at a TakeOver was ever going to top them. So uh, that's why that match is going to get three and a quarter. Uh, but the match still was really good. I thought I liked the way they structured that match where it wasn't like a wrestling match. It was a ball. For the Hideo Itami, uh Alistair Black match, I'll probably give that match three stars. I thought that was a good match. Um, I thought that match would have delivered a little bit more than it did. Um, and then for the uh, NXT Women's Championship match, I'll probably give that match a four and a half. I thought that was a uh, really good um, NXT Women's title match. I thought it really good, told a story, and I liked the stuff that's, um, you know, I liked the fallout from it and stuff. And then for the, the NXT Championship match, I thought that match was really good, and I'm going to give that match probably four and a four, no, sorry, four and a quarter star. Um, pretty much for the same reasons. I just enjoyed the NXT Women's Title match more. I think because the NXT Women's Title match was everything I expected and more. This match I still thought was really good. Um, I think if it had a little bit of a better story going into it, because obviously they had that stuff, because this I didn't think this got as much focus as it should have since they had Roderick Strong involved. I thought it was really good. And um, overall, um, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. If you want to check out my past reviews, for uh, NXT TakeOvers, click on down in the description box down below um, on the playlist. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, make sure you guys like, comment, and, subs um, and uh, share this video so that way people will watch it. Make sure you guys subscribe to uh, this YouTube channel for more content and click on the bell so that way every time I upload a video, you guys will get the notification for it. Make sure you guys do the same for my CM Brothers and no one the Talking Data YouTube channels. Uh, subscribe and click on the bell so that way people will watch it. And that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.